and today I'll be presenting my project called Spikes in RL, Reinforcement Learning Derived Plasticity Rules for Spiking Neural Networks. So a lot of topics to go into, very exciting topics in my opinion, so we'll get started with the motivation for this. So the human brain is quite a complex machine, it's very cool, it's very fascinating, and maybe there are some engineering insights hidden in there. So there are all of these neurons, all of these synapses cooperating using local information. There's no central coordination system as far as we can tell, like we have in regular computers. And so it's unclear how exactly it works in a lot of ways. In neuroscience, we ask how it works. In artificial intelligence, we ask how do we build systems that might emulate some of these properties. And so in both of these things, there's a very big missing, missing piece of information, uh, and that has to do with learning. And so obviously there's a lot to learn, but this is one of the biggest uh, problems in this field, in my opinion, which is that, you know, for an individual neuron cell, we have a pretty decent understanding of how the input and output relationships work. If I stimulate it in a certain way, I can predict it fairly easily, and I understand the principles underlying the way that it integrates those inputs to make its outputs. But the manner in which and the method by which these neurons self-organize, in a sense, they change their connections to learn things and change their input-output relationship, that much is unclear in biological we don't really know how biological neurons actualize this self-organization in order to learn. And so, at a very high level, you could say that that is the uh, thesis gap, and these are some sped up videos of neurons self-organizing. It's very cool looking, got me into neuroscience, and so that is the big research gap. So, more specifically though, I want to scope it to stimulation. So, what I'm trying to find out is what does an effective learning pool look like for simulated biological networks? This is a very ambitious topic. It's a field in and of itself, so the specific objective of my thesis is to understand the applicability of this thing called Spike Sin RL that I've created, I'll describe it briefly later. So I'm trying to understand how well that can be applied to the specific class of neural network simulations called spiking neural networks, which I'll also describe right now. So starting with spiking neural networks, what are they and why are they interesting? So to motivate this, you know, it's important to understand the hassle that is modeling biological neurons. So these are enormously painful to actually simulate. You know, we have these equations uh, that are pretty good. You know, they won the Nobel Prize for it, Hodgkin and Huxley in the 60s. They found this very complicated partial differential equation for how these kind of work, how the inputs map to the outputs, but it is very slow to simulate. In fact, all of this uh, map is just for this one resistor in the model, and this whole thing is just for a differentially small piece of the cell surface. So, enormously painful to simulate, especially when we're trying to simulate networks of neurons. And so, on the other side of the spectrum, there are rate-based neural networks. This is essentially the workhorse of modern machine learning, and this makes a lot of simplifications, in some senses, a bit of an oversimplification by replacing the spikes that the previous model uh, worked with. So, in the other one, it was a time series where it would emit these spikes of voltage to other cells. They replaced those with just spike rates, so now we go from a time series to a scalar value, we're now able to just use matrix algebra to map from the spike or from the spike rates input to the spike rates output, and we can also apply matrix algebra optimizations like gradient descent in order to learn. And so that is what we have here. And so a couple of problems with that though uh, are that this is not a particularly energy efficient way to do things at scale. You know, modern machine learning methods uh, that are implemented on von Neumann architectures, they take hundreds of thousands, if not millions of watts to train whereas your brain actually runs on 12 watts, so there's some efficiency there. As well, there is, uh, they're not very biologically feasible the way that they actualize learning, so it doesn't give us much to go on when we're trying to inform hypotheses in neuroscience based on the manner in which they self-organize. So these spiking neural networks, meanwhile, are kind of a nice middle ground. They maintain some of the behaviors from the Hodgkin-Huxley, very realistic models in the sense that they communicate by spikes uh, that are time-bound, and they also have this spatio-temporal summation property, but they also apply some of the simplifications of artificial neural networks, namely that all of the state variables are now scalars instead of being uh, on the cell, cell uh, membrane topology uh, defined at every point, as well as uh, the synapse weights, the connectivities between neurons, they're also scalars in this model, rather than being uh, you know, many segmented things to integrate an equation of that. So this is the rough picture of what this looks like if there's time uh, end during the question period, I'll come back to it, but it essentially maps some incoming spike trains uh, that are these time series. It goes through this computation and then to some post-synaptic spike trains or post-neuron spike trains through this transformation, 
where it uh, has this leaky integrate and fire model. Happy to come back to this in the question time, but the point is, this is a nice middle ground between the two, and it's also an open place to explore because there's this efficient hardware for running these networks, but nobody really knows what a strong learning rule might look like for these, for these systems. So if we can figure that out, we might make some nice progress. So going back to the thesis objective, we now have a rough sense of what spiking neural networks are, why they might be interesting. And so now we can move on to this spike SYNRL methodology that I have been working on. So starting off with what we know, roughly speaking, about learning biological neural networks. So one of the first observations that was made is something called heavy learning. Essentially, that if there's high correlation between the presynaptic spike train and the postsynaptic spike train, the synapse connecting those two will be strengthened. Meanwhile, if there's not, it will not be strengthened. So if there's high correlation between this guy and this guy, for instance, then this synapse weight will increase. That's the observation there. There's a bit more of an advanced version of that that takes into account that it appears that the presynaptic spike train actually has to be causally related to the postsynaptic spike train represented here. Uh, and then another uh, important note in this is that you know there's an observation that in a lot of brain regions, it appears to be reward motivated the way that synapses change their connectivity. So for instance, in the basal ganglia, dopamine is the operative reward signaler, and synapses seem to change up how they're connected to optimize for that dopamine response. And so uh, hypothesis here is that uh, you know the synapses somehow observe the correlation between themselves and the reward signal, and that is how they inform their changes in connectivity. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that works later. And finally, we have modulatory networks. So it appears, given some genetic evidence from mice cortex experiments, that there are about 20 different uh, you know, peptides or proteins used that the neurons kind of diffuse passively to signal messages to the surrounding neurons. And uh, this is uh, another information channel that they have at their disposal, where these signals are diffused instead of spike-based, and uh, they're non-specific, but they're based on the neurons type and the, the receiving neurons type and also the transmitting neurons type. So synthesizing this to motivate the uh, approach that I have uh, created. So what we notice when we try to apply these things to creating learning rules in simulations of neural networks is that heavy in learning and STDP tend to lead to unstable networks. The weights explode to infinity, it's kind of problematic. As well, reward correlated learning where we just modulate the uh, synapse strength and then try to look for correlation with the reward that tends to scale poorly to larger and larger networks because it's hard to tell which synapse is responsible for the change in the reward. And finally, computational work where people try to understand at a theoretical level how these neuromodulators might be used to inform learning, uh, they tend to focus on approximating the backpropagation signals from these matrix algebra optimizations that we discussed before. They try to approximate those using hand-derived formula, which tends to be quite lossy. A lot of information is lost, and the transmission is by no means optimal. And so this motivates the agent-based approach where, uh, you know, based on our understanding of biology, it seems like cells are very well mod uh, modeled by agents. So they make decisions as to how, when and how to release neurotransmitters and also how they adjust their weight as a function of time in particular. They also have some memory where they can observe and maintain an internal state that is represented by biochemicals that informs the computation and the decisions over time as well. And finally, they appear to cooperatively seek some reward through these decisions. And so these hypotheses are all well and good. It appears that existing stuff doesn't take a lot of these things into account, but that's no good as long as I can't come up with a update formula for each synapse, this delta W function. And so the way that I plan to do that, or the way that this methodology does that, is through reinforcement learning. And as much as I'd love to explain the entirety of reinforcement learning, it's one of my favorite subjects. For the purposes of this, reinforcement learning is used to infer a function that returns the best action given the current state, where the best action is the one that will yield maximum reward over time. And so in this case, each synapse is a reinforcement learning agent executing the same policy and learning the same policy, where it can either increase, decrease, or maintain its weight. Its state includes observations of the network level of reward, as well as their previous actions, maybe some other variables related to SGDP, as we discussed, quiescence, just whether or not neurons around it are firing, and some neurotransmitter messages. And the reward is just whether it got better or worse at the task. And the goal is to learn this function pi, this policy, this rule set, that says, okay, given this state, the best action is this. And so that is the rough outline. I'll briefly outline the preliminary results, if that's all right, even though I'm getting close to time. 
So the full results are pending the final pieces of work. I'm still running them on uh, supercomputers. So in the meantime, here is an example of the type of experiment we might run. So here we have the input-output relationship before training. What I want is for this network, it's kind of hard to see the colors, but these green dots relate to the network that I want to train, and I want it to produce very similar output to this red network. So I want the dots to pretty much line up, and I want it to change its weights in the network so that the dots line up as long as I give it this same input spike train here. So it has one output, five output, or sorry, one input, five outputs. So that's before training, that's after training. And as you can see, the dots actually did get a bit closer to what the red dots look like. And we can look a bit closer looking at the loss function. So this is using my methodology, this reinforcement learning methodology, simultaneously training the RL algorithm as well as the network. And what we observe is that, hey, it actually does decrease loss over time. The loss gets quite small. Here we see the network losses versus iteration, and here we see the basically the trajectories of each synapse strength over time. And it actually does appear to be learning something, which is quite interesting, quite satisfying. And another thing that I observed is that when I stopped the reinforcement learning algorithm from updating itself, so I had it stop doing this reinforcement learning update and just applied the rule set, that pi function, statically to the same problem, it actually worked better. So if we go back and forth, it converged slightly faster, in fact to the end value, this end loss of around 200. And so that was kind of surprising as well. That implies that the reinforcement learning aspect of this is not actually pulling the load. It's actually the rule set that is learning, which is very promising to me. And so we observe that the methodology yields convergence on some of these small network matching tasks. The static policy also still yields convergence, which is very satisfying. That implies that we're learning something good, not just putting the weight of the challenge on the RL model. And finally, we see that uh, you know, it seems like this might be a promising avenue for inferring learning rules at scale, obviously pending the final results as I try to scale this up, learn more about the nature of the solutions that it comes up with. But yeah, in terms of the next steps, I'll be looking to implement message passing. That is the one feature that I have yet to implement if I start implementing in these tests. So I'll hope to have a policy that tells it how to diffuse these neuromodulator messages. It will be very noisy, very biological. And I'll also be looking to scale these simulations and look at the factors that lead to the success or failure of training, which policies work, how to generate those policies, and finally, looking to implement more expressive reinforcement learning algorithms, because currently I'm actually just using tabular reinforcement learning to do all of this, and uh, these more expressive models will be able to have a continuous state space, which is quite nice and quite a bit more biological, because biological systems tend to have continuous variables. So that is my presentation. I really hope you enjoy exploring these topics. I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. <laughs> questions? As you're thinking of them, I'll show you some cool videos, if that's all right. <laughs> I didn't get to do this because I was, you know, this is a very packed presentation already. But I thought these were cool. Uh, so these are some videos of biological neurons self-organizing, uh, which I thought were very cool. These are obviously sped up, but I think it's very interesting to observe how different they appear to be. If you guys have done machine learning stuff in the past, you know, these are really just cells that are kind of twitching around, moving around. And that's actually what's happening in your brain, which I think is like the coolest thing ever. This is what, part of what got me into neuroscience in the first place. I was watching these and being like, damn, how does that work? So that was pretty cool, I thought. And uh, on the other side of things, this is an animation from Chris Ola, a great machine learning guy. Uh, he worked at DeepMind for a while, I think. Uh, so essentially this is a depiction of how the data is transformed through a neural network. So here we have the, every time it has a linear transformation, that's the matrix multiplication, and every time it kind of scrunches together uh, like it will in a second, this scrunch right here is the nonlinear activation function that is being applied. And I think this is a very cool way to look at the way that neural networks work in these rate-based models. I think that, uh, I don't know, if I were teaching neural networks, I would definitely bring this up, because I think it's very cool. Anyway, questions? So I was curious about at the end when you were showing sort of the preliminary results, we have this, uh, uh, I was curious sort of the differences between the left and right panels here, um, where you know at some point around this iteration, I don't know, the 8,000 or so, the, the loss kind of bottoms out, but this integral of the, uh, the action kind of continues to decrease. Yeah. So I've been looking at that a lot. That's a big part of the reason that I have made these plots. So. A thing that I'm working on and trying to understand are the properties of the training task that will lead to a well-calibrated uh, algorithm. So sometimes, you know, 
I'll randomly instantiate a model, and like this one, the training, the model I'm trying to train has weights that are a bit too high, and so most of them are actually decreasing with time, and that yields good loss. And so I can look at the statistics about the policy itself and also about the actions over time. And so what I observe is that it's very dependent on the task that I'm having it do. And so one thing that I'm looking to do next is actually have it be uh, what I would call symmetric. So I would simultaneously train, uh, you know, I would simultaneously have one run that is training or network A to produce the outputs of network B, and then also have one that's trying to make network B produce the output of network A. That way, I'm hoping that it can be a bit more balanced in the way that it uh, produces this policy and yeah, so that it can hopefully learn something a bit better than this. But yeah, I've observed this a few times and in other experiments, it's a bit better calibrated and in other ones, it's the opposite direction. So definitely a good insight and a good catch there and something that I'm working to understand the mechanics of and the factors that lead to it for sure. So great question. about this um, with a, a prof during some visits to some schools and so it seems like um, you know in the brain the way that that actually works you know because we do have neurogenesis we do have neurons being created and dying and also being reallocated essentially you know it seems like in the brain uh, what we have is this thing called population coding so instead of a single neuron acting as sort of its own agent encoding its own thing like we see in a lot of machine learning models uh, we have populations of neurons that are doing that, and so it's kind of unclear actually how exactly neuro new neurons uh, are incorporated into this, how old neurons are dying, but my hypothesis, and the one that uh, I sort of agreed on with this uh, guy, was that um, the way that that would happen is that through this population coding, you know, if you have a population of neurons that's encoding, you know, a particular element within this network, then adding a neuron to that does not really change the outcome of the population, and it can learn to incorporate itself into that, and then as it increases in complexity, the expressiveness of this population can increase and it can, in a sense, become two populations effectively that represent two different quantities. And so that's like one hypothesis, but it is as of yet unknown how that kind of stuff works. I kind of scoped the thesis to just be in this uh, static uh, regime because we don't even know how that works. Right. So it was uh, a bit of a thing like that, but great question, yeah. Maybe in my PhD I'll figure it out, but <laughs> <laughs> This may be like a naive question, but you know, um, obviously you are kind of using like biological observation for spaces and stuff, which is more like a lot of care. Um, are there different behaviors in different parts of the brain? I don't think that's naive at all. Like I think, uh, so yes, we do definitely observe different behaviors. Like as I mentioned, this reward seeking behavior, for instance, is generally uh, associated with uh, this region called the basal ganglia. And so uh, certainly we observe these different behaviors, you know, different parts of the brain seem to do different tasks. You know, some people make the analogy, you know, the basal ganglia does reinforcement learning, this reward cor correlated learning, the cortex does unsupervised learning, kind of like an autoencoder or something like that. And uh, there are other analogies like the balance of those supervised learning, a bunch of things like this. And so, um, yeah, certainly there are different rules in different parts of the brain. Uh, and so this is pretty narrowly scoped, I suppose, to the parts of the brain that are doing this reward correlation work. Uh, because I think that that's quite an interesting part. But certainly, uh, as a future investigation, I have some ideas for how to investigate the parts that are doing this unsupervised learning by having some information maximization metric as opposed as the reward function, as opposed to this dopaminergic uh, analog. So, great question. Yeah, certainly there are different uh, parts of the brain that appear to offer. Thank you. 